We want to welcome everyone here this Father's Day. And uh, we are very blessed that God has blessed us with children and uh, as fathers. And uh, I was informed that we didn't have them, but we're thankful for them. Amen. And I'm thankful also that we didn't have them, but that uh, the Lord gave us wonderful wives to have them. Praise the Lord. But what an honor it is in, uh, to be a father that God would, would give us as men, children, and uh, how wonderful that is and what a blessing children are from the Lord. And we're very thankful for our Heavenly Father who sent His only begotten Son to come and die so that we can have life and that we could have life eternal and a joyful Christian life. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to read uh, uh, Psalms uh, 65, and we're going to bring uh, praise to our God, uh, and uh, as we now enter His gates with thanksgiving and praise in our hearts. To you, there, uh, there will be silence and praise in Zion, O God, and to you the vow will be paid. O you who hear prayer... To, your, to you, you, all flesh comes. Words of iniquity prevail against me as for our transgression. You anoint, uh, you atone for them. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you, that he would dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with goodness of your house, your holy temple. By fearsome, uh, fearsome deeds, you answer us in righteousness, O God, of our salvation. You who are the trust of all the ends of the earth and of the fairest sea, who establishes the mountains by His strength, who stills, stills the rumbling of the seas, the rumbling of their ways, and the tumult of the peoples. They who inhabit the ends of the earth are in fear on account of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. You visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. You establish their grain, for thus you establish the earth. Your water, you water its furloughs abundantly. You smooth its ridges, you soften it with showers, you bless its growth, you crown the year with your goodness. The pastures of the wilderness drip, and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing, and the valley are covered with grain, and they make a loud shout, indeed they sing. Let us pray. Father, you are so good uh, to us. Uh, you have blessed us beyond measure. Uh, we thank you for all the many blessings that you have blessed us with, first and foremost in Christ Jesus. We thank you for his work. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you, uh, Father, that you sent him to redeem us. And we're grateful to you. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for your example your example to Christ and to us as fathers also. And you call us uh, to be like Him. And we're thankful that you have given us your indwelling Holy Spirit so that we can do the things that you would have us do. So we do ask this day that you would be made much of, that you would be high and lifted up as the psalmist has done. We're thankful as the psalmist opens with that you hear our prayer, that you have promised to hear our prayer. And Father, we do ask for forgiveness for the areas that we have sinned against you this past week and even this day. We ask that you would cleanse us uh, so that we can hear your word and then that you would then fill us with the blessed Holy Spirit so that we could glorify you even in our hearing but most importantly, not only our hearing, but that we would be doers of the Word. And so we ask now that you would speak to us this day as we come to bring glory to your holy name and we come to worship you in truth and spirit. 
And we're thankful that you are the one that has created all things. And you've created all things for your glory. Great is thy faithfulness. We thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've started our worship with the Word of God and then prayer. And now we're going to start with a <clears throat> continue with a song. Why did you say? Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again i give my life to follow Everything I believe in, now I surrender. And Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing. For the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave and Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Right. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, again, happy Father's Day. Uh, this morning, our scripture reading is Mark 8, 11 through 21, so you can prepare for that. Uh, not a lot of announcements. In fact, I really don't have any this morning other than... Um, I don't, so let's take a time of silence, and then I'll read God's Word. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply and in his spirit and said, 
Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to, the, given to this generation. And he left them and got into the boat and went to the other side. Now, they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing this one another, the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that we have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves of the, for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the, sev <clears throat> and the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Adoration. We bow our hearts, we lift our hands, we turn our eyes to you again, and we surrender to the truth. That all we need is found in you. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. Turn our eyes towards the prize, the upward call of God in Christ. You have our hearts, Lord, take our lives. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration. Everything you've made resounds. All creation standing now, lifting up your name. We're joining in the angel song. We're gathered to the ancient throne. Children in our Father's arms. Shouting out your praise. Receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God. Receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. Receive our adoration. Jesus, Lamb of God, receive our adoration, how wonderful you are. Our hope for years to come, our 
shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Beneath the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure, sufficient in thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Sons away, they fly forgotten as a dream, guides in the opening day. Speak, 
go, Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truth unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises. And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till the church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Thank you, brother leading us into worship. If you can't stand for the reading of the Word of God, we'll read together. And, uh, well, an unusual title today, but uh, nevertheless, that's what we're seeing in the beginning verses. We're seeing the, uh, the blind who will not see, speaking of these religious leaders. So, if uh, in here, uh, today, we will see uh, the hardening of the heart and, uh, and just how they'll dig in and uh, really uh, continue to go against our Lord. Let us pray now and seek the face of God as we look into another teaching from our Lord's ministry during His incarnation. Father, to think that You would love us enough to send Your very best from heaven to come down and to die so that we could have life is just simply amazing. Salvation is just is something, as many say, we'll never fully understand, but we know that You are a God of love and that You did love us. You loved us and You sent our Savior, Jesus Christ, to come and take Your full wrath on Him who knew no sin so we can be called the children of God. Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know You as Lord and Savior and hasn't come by faith yet, we ask that You would speak through Your Word. We know that You can do anything uh, that You would, uh, that Your Word and the will, Your will would be for those outside of Christ. And so, we ask for that this day. We ask now that You'd speak to our hearts, that we would understand this Scripture. Thank You, Lord Jesus, for coming and thank You for teaching. Thank you for teaching your disciples nearly 2,000 years ago, and thank you that we are your disciples today and that you're still teaching us. Help us now to be attentive to your word and to do the things that you would have us do. And we're just grateful to you and just praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, our text is in Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, and testing him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you not know how to discern the appearance of the, uh, the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times. Questions still being asked today. His statement, an evil and an adulterous generation eager, eagerly seeks for a sign, and a sign will not be given it except for the sign of Jonah, and he left them and went away. You could be seated and uh, as it stands, they will stand before Him on Judgment Day and have to give an account for these words. Although they may be few, uh, they bring judgment upon anyone. 
who does not turn to Christ, the Redeemer. Well, last time together, you'll remember, we, uh, we saw the Gentile people bringing their loved ones and casting them at the feet of Christ to be healed. He healed them all in Matthew 15, 30 and 31, we read, and a large crowd a large crowds came to Him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others, and laid them down at, the, at His feet, and He healed them. So the crowd, crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking. They marveled at the work of Christ, the crippled restored, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel." In this, we again saw the miracle-working power of Jesus as He had compassion for people. Next, our Lord said in Matthew 15, verse 32, and Jesus called His disciples to Him and said, I feel compassion for the crowd because they have remained with Me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. So, Jesus then we see He feeds the 4,000 men plus women and children. And in Matthew chapter 15, 38 through 39, and those who who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and came to the region of Magdalene. Jesus will bring the uh, miracles, the two miracles, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 up again in our passage today as He's teaching His disciples. So today we'll see the blind religious leaders seeking for more proof of who Jesus was. He has said He is the Messiah, the Son of God. However, they weren't looking for proof. They were looking for a reason to accuse Him and try to make Him look lower in the crowd's eyes. That's really what they wanted. They weren't uh, coming to the feet of Christ. And you could see the Lord uh, as He uh, speaks to them about their hearts. You see, they were wondering, the people, if He was the one to come, the long-awaited Messiah, but not so for the religious leaders. They had already closed their eyes and their ears. They were blind and they couldn't hear. The Lord closed them. So He leaves the Gentile region and heads again back across the lake. And you'll notice that's, that's pretty much what he's been doing. He's going into different areas. And so here again, he does this, and, uh, and he has company this time. As he arrives on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are there to meet him. And uh, pretty wild uh, conversation, although it's short. Uh, Let's look into our story today to see the many who are blind, who willingly remain blind to the truth of Jesus Christ, and one day will have to stand before Him on Judgment Day. And I'm here to tell you that we live in a city, this city of Athena, that is blind also, that there are many blind people here that need to see. They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. This world is in the same condition that these religious leaders were in. Let's look at our first point then. Show us a sign. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came testing Him, and they asked Him to show them a sign, but not just any sign, but a sign from heaven. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees came. This text should, be, should not be very strange to us. After our study thus far of Matthew, we've reached chapter 16 before the rapture. Praise the Lord. It's been steady and slow, and it should be. We're learning much about our Savior and how He ministered the life of Christ. And it helps us as we minister also because we see the same things. So, Scripture tells us they came together to test our Lord. It, look at this particular text. It, it doesn't at first jump out at you, does it? It just says the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they come together. Now, that makes no sense to us. 
what you see. However, the Pharisees and Sadducees were opposed to each other, both in their beliefs and their behavior. They're totally on opposite sides here. They're enemies of one another. So one would have to ask, why are they joining forces here? They are joining forces against the sovereign Lord of this universe. The Pharisees' name means separated. That's what the word means. And they separated themselves from everyone. They separated themselves by strict observances of the law and the traditions of Israel. But yet we read they joined together to come against Christ. You see, the Pharisees would be what we would consider today the legalist. And we see them all over this world. The Pharisees believed in the supernatural, that is miracles. The coming of Messiah, the resurrection, and the judgment at the end of time. They believed in all those things. They believed well. But the Sadducees were looking at their coming together. And they're so opposite from one another And the Sadducees did not believe in signs or supernatural events or the resurrection. And we read in Acts chapter 23, verse 8, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Now, Paul used this, if you remember. He used this in the book of Acts. Uh, He used uh, the Pharisees against the uh, Sadducees in the book of Acts. So they don't believe in just about anything, and we'll, we'll see even in our study that they had a problem with the Word of God also. Some of the Sadducees were also called the Herodians because they cooperated with the Roman government. Now, this doesn't make much sense except it's history. But if you understand that that's a war between two religious groups, there is absolutely no way that the Pharisees would side with the Roman government. They wanted to overthrow it. If they wanted the religious leaders, uh, all the religious leaders and the disciples and all the people of that day wanted uh, the Jewish Messiah to overthrow uh, the Roman government. So you're starting to see all kinds of, of conflicts as you're starting to hear Uh, who they are. And so some of the Sadducees were called the Herodians because they cooperated with the Roman government. And for their cooperation, the Roman government had given them uh, positions of leadership, and with these positions came much wealth. And so you already can see that, that that these uh, Sadducees then where the Pharisees were legalists, the Sadducees were what we would call today modernists. They did not believe the Scripture was fully of God. Well, the Pharisees were the ones that protected the Word of God. And so when you're looking at this, this is, this is something in just a few short words we're brought to understand who these religious leaders are and what they really want to do. The Sadducees looked for a Messiah, but don't get excited, for their Messiah wasn't Christ. But their Messiah, the Messiah they looked for, and something we're familiar with, was an effective political leader. That's why they sided with Rome. The Pharisees believed in the Word of God, however, they put their traditions above it. That's what we've been studying, remember? Uh, That's what the Sabbath was all about. That's what the Lord taught, that He's Lord of the Sabbath. Also about picking the corn, and you'll remember that. It should all come back in play. It's all still the life of Christ. So the Pharisees believed in the Word of God, however, they put their traditions above it. And beloved, it sounds an awful, light, uh, an awful lot like the church and the world we live in today. So Jesus was a threat to both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Scripture bears witness that they banded together, side by side, as they came to Jesus 
And what they wanted to do was prove that Jesus was an imposter, and they were hoping to discredit Him before the people. Beloved, in the, in the beliefs held by these two groups, you could expect the Pharisees and Sadducees, you can understand this, you just look at the groups. They may have come together, but they both want two different things. You have to see it. If one believes in miracles and one doesn't, but yet they're coming and asking for the Lord to show a sign, now something doesn't ring true here, does it? You see, in their beliefs, they held different beliefs by these two groups. And you could expect the Pharisees and Sadducees were actually hoping for two different circumstances. You have to understand that in who they are. They're looking for two different results in the testing of Christ here. Very interesting. So, even though they came together, they are hoping for a different outcome. Isn't that how enemies come together? We saw that at the cross. The Pharisees hoped that He would refuse or fail to do a miracle. That's really what they're doing. They're testing Him. And so they're hoping, they know He can do a miracle, they know He's done miracles, they have not denied the miracle power of the Messiah, but they're hoping He won't do the miracle. The Sadducees were sure that He could not do a miracle and that He would not be able to show them a sign from heaven. So evil is at hand. And any time you have two groups that are polar opposites that come together to test our Lord, you're going to see some fireworks, and, and we are. We're seeing the Lord's words, and they are piercing. So the Lord, as you know at this time, is facing much opposition from His enemies, just about on every side as He heads to the cross. He's close now. He's probably a month, month and a half away. I know that we're in chapter 16, so we think, oh, it's going to be a while, but no, it's, it's moving very quickly. So he's heading now toward the cross, and the religionists were concerned because he had stirred up support for the crowds in his feeding the people and performing all, all of these miracles. And you could see this in conversations, in conversations to come also. Are you going to believe? So before we move on, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And Mark tells us in Mark 8, 12, and, and sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. They're not going to demand anything of our Lord. Who do they think they are? The creator and sustainer of, of this world stands before them, and they're going to demand a miracle? And one would have to ask, as you're thinking about this text, the miracles He performed, were they not good enough for them? That they wanted a sign from in heaven? Now, the sign from heaven, in other words, a sign that only God in heaven can do. They want to see a sign up in the sky. That's what they want. They're not concerned with the, the feeding or with the lame or the blind or any of the people. See, they were denying that He was Messiah who has been sent from heaven by His Father to go to the cross, to redeem those He came to save. And in the end, in the end, it will lead to judgment. And it always does for man. If man will not repent and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will stand one day on that, that great judgment day and have to give an account to God. I like what one writer has said here. They wanted Him to make the sun stand still or send a shadow on the sundial by making it go back a dozen degrees or turn the moon into blood or pull down a star from heaven. Oh, beloved, as we have 
were aware with Noah and Joshua and Elijah and Hezekiah who these signs had been given. They wanted those kind of signs from Him before they'll believe, and they'll never believe. They can't believe. So, beloved, this will be the last time that the rulers will come to Him. He will devote most of His time now in the training of His disciples. We see this desperation to stop Him. That's what it is with the two, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, joining together against Christ, the Messiah. It's a desperation as they approach Him and are trying to tempt Him to give them a sign so that they have something to accuse Him by. Beloved, it is important for us to discuss that we are at a turning point in the life of Christ. In Matthew chapter 16, it is a very important chapter is all the chapters in Scripture. But in the life of Christ, this chapter, Matthew 16, is central to the Matthew's accounts, account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We will see after this event, our Lord will start to pull away from the people to teach His disciples privately. And this began, if you remember, back in Matthew chapter 13, when He started to teach in parables. We were told by our Lord in Matthew 13, 13, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And then again in Matthew 13, 16 through 17, But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it, speaking to His disciples. So since that time, our Lord has been teaching His disciples, and they have been making slow spiritual advances, like us. <laughs> we hear so much, but it really doesn't get down to the life, does it? We, if we ever lived by the theology we know, and we let that be turned into our doxology, we could set this world on fire for Christ as the twelve apostles did. So we understand until we reach uh, uh, something here in this particular text, since that time our Lord has been teaching His disciples. And so we understand like, like us, they make small advances. We, we make two steps forward and ten steps back and sometimes less, sometimes more. But here, until we reach a major mountaintop Revelation from Peter in chapter 16 is some of the sweetest words that I am looking forward to teaching and preaching in the coming weeks. And in verse 16 in the, in the center there, and Simon answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is where Peter makes the single most important statement in this, a true confession of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In chapter 16, we will also hear the first mention by our Lord of His church in Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, will not overpower it or prevail against it. Our Lord will also have an important teaching in Matthew 16, verse 24. And then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wishes to come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. We are looking forward to these events. Oh, beloved of the Lord, this would be like sitting at a movie theater. And they're showing the coming attractions. That's what we have before us. One of the greatest statements, the greatest statements ever said in all of Scripture, we will look at. 
the church. And then his words to his disciples. Wonderful messages that we look forward to these important messages from the Scripture. So then the Pharisees and Sadducees request from him to do a sign, but no sign will be given. Instead, he will give them two great warnings. These warnings are not for them only, but for every man that has ever walked this earth. Beware of being blind to the sign of the times. This, we could pause and preach a message out of Noah's encounter, how they were blind and only eight people got on the boat. Our generation is just as blind, and they're willingly blind. They willingly reject Jesus Christ. So then the Pharisees and Sadducees, we see, they come to our Lord, and they want to see a sign, but instead He gives them that first warning. The second then, He tells them the only sign that they'll see is the sign of Jonah, and that's the cross. That's where God's love and judgment would rest upon Christ. So later in verses 5 through 12, he will warn to beware of the false teachers also. Let's look at our next point, though. Point two, the blind to, they're blind to the true sign, and look at how the Lord ministers to them. But he replied to them in verse uh, 2 and uh, 3, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. So the sign they wanted was denied and the overriding rebuke from our Lord is dealing with their spiritual blindness. Don't miss it. But he replied to them, they wanted to see a sign in the sky, so our Lord pointed to the sky. <laughs> The Lord is so good with His teaching. When it is evening, you say it will be fair whether for the sky is red. You want a sign? So, beloved, even at the time of our Lord's incarnation, people had a great interest in the weather. Like it is today for our generation. In fact, we probably all have checked the weather to see what it would be like today. Well, they had a fascination with weather. And so the Lord is going to speak to them about this uh, observing of, of the weather and compares it to the sign of His return and His first coming. So our Lord says to them, you can read the signs of the sky. There was an old mariner's saying, red sky at night, sailors what? Delight. You guys know it. Red sky in the morning, sailors warning. And they knew this. This was, uh, it was a saying at their time, so they understood it. Uh, and over many years, man has been observing if it is a red sky in the morning, often it is followed by a storm. Now, the religious leaders of our Lord's Day accepted this without question. And that's part of what He's pointing us to. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. So, Jesus will ask them a question that everyone must face. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the sign of the times? Do you know how to discern the sign of the times? For us, it would be the return of Jesus Christ, where He will judge this earth. He will judge man. It will be a seven-year tribulation period that will unfold. We'll be with Him at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we see we will return with Him at the second coming of Christ for a thousand-year reign. If people aren't ready, then judgment is what they need to know is the sign of the times. So, Jesus addresses a big problem with the scribes and, uh, and Pharisees, and beloved, it's for all humanity. They were both, uh, they were both proud of their religious positions, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and of their training. However, 
as we heard, they were able to observe the weather, but they failed, spiritually speaking, because of their lack of knowledge of what God was doing in the world at the, at the time that Christ walked this earth. That's what the Lord's saying. You, you've missed me. I am the Messiah, the promised one. You know the signs. You know how to tell the weather. You think you're so clever. You see, they were privileged to live during the time, the times of refreshing and redemption. God has sent His very best from heaven, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. This was the beginning of the Messianic age that the Jewish people have been looking for. They have been waiting for the fullness of time. God sent forth His Son in the fullness of time to be born of a virgin, which they denied. But their blindness, because of their evil hearts, led them to their rejection of Jesus Christ. And they will continue to stay blind and in a state of judgment. Let's look now to our third point. We see then a pronouncement. There's a pronouncement here in verse 4. 3 and 4 say, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. So the Lord had just pointed out that they were spiritually blind to the sign of times. Matthew 8, 12 says, And sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of Jonah. So Jesus was distressed at the unbelief and the lack of spiritual understanding of these religious leaders who should have been leading Israel to the path of where and who the Messiah was. That's really what they should have been doing. That is the sign of the times. In verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation eagerly seeks for a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. So we see an evil, adulterous generation eagerly seeks for a sign. Jesus knew that even if he had performed a miracle, that they would still not have believed in him. As Jesus alone knows the true motives and the intent of every single man's heart. After all this points again to the reason that our Lord spoke to them in parables. In Matthew 13, 13 through 15. There would, they, would, they, would be, uh, they would know why He would do what they were requesting. They know this. God does not bow to sinful man. Man must bow before a holy God. The sign of the times are an evil and adulterous generation. Because of man's evil heart, they ask him for more signs, and like their generation, he came to his own and they rejected him. There would never be enough signs for them to turn from their rejection Their mind had already been made up. They decided long ago that their mind had been made up. Beloved, I remember witnessing uh, to uh, a young man and preaching the gospel uh, to him, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And I remember a strange request. He said, "Uh, well, I'll tell you what. If God does a miracle then I'll I'll accept him. It happens today. Man is blind, demanding for more of a miracle. You know what I told him. The miracle that has already taken place is that God left heaven, came down to this earth, and died so that sinful men like you could be saved. He wasn't saved because he was blind and he demanded a sign from God. This scripture is not far from us, beloved, if you talk to people. They're still looking for signs today. And a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. No sign 
the final sign then, the sign of Jonah was the final sign that Jesus Christ gave to this world. That is the final sign. The sign of Jonah was the final sign Jesus gave to this world. The sign of His victory, beloved of the Lord, you can get excited today. It's the sign of His victory. It's a victory sign. It's His victory over sin and death and Satan through His resurrection. That is the only sign that anyone is going to receive today. It is the same. This was, of our, Lord's, this was our Lord's mission. His death, burial, and resurrection summarized that He came to His own, and His own received Him not. But He came to seek and to save the lost. He would be securing a gospel of salvation for all those He would save. He knew His mission. He knew what He was doing. Our, our Lord explains back in Matthew 12, 38 through 40, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll remember this, answered and said to Him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But He answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation eagerly seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to you but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea, the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You'll remember we went through this sign, and one has said, like Jonah, they cast our Lord overboard, and God raised Jonah out of the depth, uh, depths of the water and the belly of the great fish. The same could be said that the sacrifice of Jonah calmed the raging sea for the men on the boat. But, beloved, our Lord's death on the cross of Calvary made peace for His elect. By His death, He paid the price and took God's full wrath so we could live. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, this is a picture uh, of the death of Jonah himself, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Christ died and was risen. Our Lord was in the heart of the earth as Jonah was in the depth of the sea, but Jonah rose again and his ministry was full of the power of God. And we see also that God raised him, our Lord, uh, raised our Lord up in his resurrection by his power. Just like in the scripture, Jonah's ministry was affirmed by him being spit out on the ground. And he was told to go and do what he didn't do the first time. So the Lord's ministry attested that he was the Son of God, the awaited Messiah, and he has proved, he's proved this by many miracles, healings, the raising from the dead. His teachings should have helped them, but instead, and you will experience this also, they became angrier. And they came together to go against our Lord and Savior. Matthew Henry says this on our verse, Jonas was a servant, Jesus was a master. Jonas, Jonah preached only one sermon, Jesus preached many. That sermon was a short one. Jesus Christ labored long over souls. Jonah only preached one message. Jonas was a man full of infirmities, he was a sinner, and with an unliving, loving heart. He refused to obey God, but Jesus was tender and compassionate. Is that not what we see in the Scriptures? Jonas did not hurry through the streets crying. Uh, Jonah but uh, did hurry through the streets crying. Yet forty days and Nineveh will, shall be overtaken without a word of mercy, though. You remember the end of the story. He was mad at God because he knew God was going to show compassion. In fact, he says that. So during the life of Christ, uh, Christ lived among the people, giving them directions that they needed to follow through his teachings. He gave them many warnings and invitations to seek and to find salvation only through him. Behold, a greater than Jonah is here. 
Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He had compassion on all the people. Jonah did not want to bring the Word of God to the people because he knew God was a God of compassion and that He would save them. I wish the religious leaders thought the same. Beloved, God alone has resurrection power. He alone is able to raise the dead. He raises dead men even today. A Jesus Christ raises dead men today. And it's through His life, death, and resurrection. The same way all of us come, we come through the path of the cross. So, through His death, many will live. Let's look at our last phrase in verse 4, and He left them and went away. Jesus not only departed from them because the Pharisees and Sadducees would not believe on Him as Lord and Savior, so He left them. But meaning, the meaning here, really, in its fullness, is He left them behind. That's what the word in the Greek means, that He left them behind, like our words would be the words we would use, forsaken or abandoning. That's what the word points to, abandoning them. He left them. He turned from them. No longer, no longer will they hear from Him again. So the thought is the same as also in 2 Peter uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 15, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Baal, the son of Burr, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And this is the same for all men that refuse to see Christ. So in the beginning of our message today, I had mentioned that this chapter makes an important transition in our Lord's ministry. He turned away from these religious leaders and spent most of his time now training his disciples. He gave no more arguments or signs for unbelievers, only more truth to those who have believed. And that's what we looked at in those verses in Matthew 13. You see, in the day we live in, man thinks that they are so smart. He has decided, man has decided how the world we live in will end. We hear that. They don't want to hear what Peter says about how this world is going to end. They think it's going to be by global warming and the wrong. He has decided how the world we live in will end. He has decided that there is no truth and that God and the Bible don't matter. This is what what man has done today. They have tried the best they can in Romans 1. They worship the creation instead of the Creator. They're in all kinds of sin, and God gives them over. They refuse to give God the glory, and they, like the religious leaders in our Lord's day, are blind to the sign of the times we live in. And if you're here today, don't be blind to the signs. All you have to do is listen to the news for five minutes, and you know the end is near. Many men think that understanding world events or or politics or economics is what's important, and I'm here to tell them it isn't what's important. What's important is how well you know Him, the God of this universe, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the work of the Blessed Spirit in salvation. Like our Lord explained today, it is a spiritual matter. The sign of the times is a spiritual matter that sets before us. If man remains blind to who Jesus is and why He came, what what will this man do on Judgment Day? Question. What will you do on Judgment Day when you've rejected this offer of salvation that Jesus Christ has come into the world? to save sinners such as us. There is only one way, and Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth. No man can go to the Father but through Him. So today, if you have not placed your faith and trust in Christ, 
and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you also will remain blind to who He is and why He came. In Galatians 1.4 we read, who gave Himself for our sins so that He might rescue us from this present evil age. This present age is evil. If that is your sign that you need Jesus Christ, you need His blood to wash away your sins, who gave Himself, Jesus Christ gave Himself for our sins so that He might rescue us, from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. In closing, I'd like to work with you now through some examples of our age and the sign of the times also. I want you to notice with me, Paul tells us, rescue us from this present age. That's in the verse I just read. Rescue us from this present age. You see, this world, beloved of the Lord, is hostile to God and is set against you. This evil world is set against the believer who is going to live his or her life for Christ. For the Christian here today, Jesus said to His disciples just before His arrest and crucifixion in John chapter 15 verses 18 through 19, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, because of this world, this world... uh, Because of this, the world hates you. Beloved, these are the sign of the times. We could see what's happening with Christians all over this world. Some, as we speak, being beheaded. Some being martyred and killed for Christ. Some being imprisoned. Our brothers and sisters, many of them escape persecution through death. And praise be to God. And God will see them through. But for the Christian here today, Jesus said to His disciples just before His arrest and crucifixion, if the world hated me, they're going to hate you. If you're not willing to stand up for Jesus Christ, Jesus has some words for you. He said, if you deny me amongst men, I will deny you. When you stand before my Father. How does that, how does that uh, match up to a Christian that says, I don't want to speak about my faith? Listen, that's all you have. If you have Jesus Christ, then you have to speak up. That's why He left you here. That's why He saved you. In Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 15, beloved, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. God has us here for a reason. And the reason isn't to build better homes and to have nice cars, although that's not bad, but it's to be a gospel witness to Jesus Christ. To go ye therefore into all of our neighborhoods, And tell our neighbors about Jesus Christ. The time is short. The signs of the times are before us. Beloved, we need to understand and acknowledge that this present time is evil and it hates God. You are not going to be able to cuddle up to this world and try to be friendly with your neighbors and think that they're going to like you. Because they hate God and they're going to hate you. That's your position. That's who we are. We're Christians, Christ-like, mouthpieces for the gospel. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, for he says, at the, time, at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I helped you. Beloved, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, Paul here points us to two facts. 
Although we live in an evil age, it is also a time when God has acted in Christ to accomplish your salvation and my salvation. Paul wrote in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Oh, it's pretty clear. The sign of the times, He will return. And He will return in judgment, like in the day of Noah. And then we, who belong to Christ, would have wished that we opened our mouths while we had time. For the time is short. Behold, now is the time. Our Lord is approaching Jerusalem on Palm Sunday when He had looked around and He began to weep, saying in Luke chapter 19, 14, And they will level level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. They did not recognize that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the incarnate Christ, came to suffer so that we could have life. He visited this earth. They rejected Him, and instead they wanted another sign. We know the Lord speaking here about 70 A.D., Titus will come in, he'll destroy Israel, and not a stone would be not overturned. Reason being, when you read history, is he wanted to get all the gold. He burned even the rocks in the temple to burn the gold off of them. That one stone, that Jesus Christ says, will not leave a stone which will not be overturned. The time is short. You say the people have been given time to repent of their sins and to be saved through Christ. You see, that's the sign of the times. You have time. We've heard the story today. They refused His offer, and as a result of their rejection, the time is drawing near. The end is near. The time is short. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 7, 29. But this I say, brothers, the time has been shortened so that from now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none. Listen, the time is short. We don't know when, but believe me, we know by looking at the sign of the times. It's imminent. The message of our Lord today points us to the fact that we are in His time of grace. Listen, that's the time right now. The sign of the time that we live in today is the time of God's grace. You know this, beloved. For the unsaved, the time is short. We call you to repent and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The day of grace will not last If you refuse to repent and be saved, you will soon have to deal with not the day of of grace, but the day of God's judgment. And when this happens, when the Lord returns, your opportunity will be over. That's the sign of the times that we should be warning people about. It's pretty clear. The day of God's judgment will come. Uh, Jesus said to the religious leaders of His day in verse 3, And in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the sign of the times? If you have heard this message today, then you have enough information to discern the sign of the times correctly. You have been given time to repent and to turn to Christ. I ask, what will you do with this Jesus? Will you turn Him away or will you cry out to Him? 
Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. In Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, we read, And do this, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. If you're an unbeliever, the time is now. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. The hour is now awaken from your sleep. Repent of your sin and call upon the Savior, and He will save you. For salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, speaking to the Christians now, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Both warnings there, both to the unsaved and then the Christian, how we are to walk in the ways of the Lord. If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ more now, when did you ever love Him? He demonstrated His love by coming and dying so that whosoever believes in Him through faith, through grace, through Christ, you could be saved. You see, some of the many signs that the religious leaders and the people should have recognized during the life of Christ that proved that He was Messiah are endless. We have the weeks of ages. I wish we had another hour to just teach through that in the book of Daniel. The prophet Elijah, the baby Jesus born in a manger, the coming of a great person, the greatest person ever born, the God-man Jesus Christ. You see, many Jews were looking for Messiah. And Jesus' miracles, every single miracle should have pointed that He was the fulfillment of those prophecies. Beloved, it has been said that while Augustine was in the garden of his friend's estate in Italy, he was convicted by those words interpreted at the times correctly, turned from his sin and trusted Christ as his Savior and became by God's grace the greatest theologian of his generation. Listen again to the powerful words of Scripture that Augustine 2,000 years ago heard, and the Word of God is sharper than anything, any two-edged sword. It will pierce through any heart. Listen to the words again. I've read them earlier, but you need to hear them. These are the words that brought Augustine to life, great theologian lover of Christ. In Romans 13, 11 through 14, and do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation, listen to me if you're here without Christ, now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone. Judgment is upon us. It is upon America, and it is upon this world. The end times started at the cross our Lord died and at His resurrection. The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Therefore, lay lay aside the second words of the Scripture. The first of what he was saved of. The second, the warning. Therefore, lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual sexual, uh, sensitivity, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. You see, for the elect here today, Beloved, we rejoice in our Savior and are thankful that He called us out of darkness. 
that in the fullness of time He not only sent forth His Son, but in the fullness of time that God called you out of darkness. What a Savior! And He's still saving men today. He's still a miracle-working God. You see, as the elect, we have been forgiven and our sin has been atoned for. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and have been set free from sin and death. Oh, beloved of the Lord, don't take these words lightly. For the unbeliever, you have heard the Scripture, knowing the sign of the times. No matter how young you are or how old you are, you can look at the sign of the times and say, God is not going to let this go on forever. You see, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to you. It's nearer to you today. You've heard the gospel. You've seen the Savior. Will you believe by faith in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary? Will you come? Will you repent? Will you call upon the only name that can save you? I want to end with a, a story before I pray. A great uh, Puritan pastor preached the gospel message to a young man that was in the church service. Pastor Flavel was his name. He preached this message and It had been about 70 or so years later that this young man that heard the gospel message, the day that Pastor Flavel preached it, was sitting on a hill thinking about his life. He had just retired. And he's sitting on a hill thinking about his life. And trust me, if you're young, it goes quick. The Lord Jesus Christ, through the work of the blessed Holy Spirit and the Word of God, the Word of promise, came to this man, now an old man. He remembered every single word that that message had, every single scripture. The Spirit of God pierced his heart and brought him to life in Christ Jesus. Listen, the Word of God is powerful. The message of the gospel is dynamite, as Romans 1.18 says. And when it works, it explodes. I pray today that you'll think about the sign of the times. And if He does return where you will stand, will you stand on heaven's side with Him, or will you stand on hell's side with Satan? Father, Your Word is just amazing. Uh, we're just so thankful uh, for this encounter that our Lord and Savior had today with these religious leaders. Father, we know we've left so much on the table. There's so much uh, in Your Word. But Father, take these loaves and this fish and multiply it. Father, if it would please you to save someone here today or on the internet, we ask that you would use this word, even the words that you saved your servant Augustine with. Father, some people think that it has to be a gospel-centered verse for someone to be saved. But Father, we have heard testimonies over the years, and we understand your word, just one jot and one tittle would save man. Yet you're the author of salvation, that man must repent and come to you. Father, the time is short. You only know the time. But Father, you have given us enough in Scripture to understand that the time is short. And so we ask now for your help and ask for the lost that they might be saved. Father, so they could glorify you. And we love you and praise you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
going to finish up with another song, Worship. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for oh, me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for oh, me. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough, heaven's reaching down to us, your grace is enough for me. Amen. Our benediction this week is from 1 Timothy. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal might. Amen. God bless. Make it a great week.